So, uh, the plan of today is to talk about the alternating cycle of uh, politics and forgetting uh, the past and remembering the past in Taiwan. But before I start, um, it is a place quite far and quite unknown, I think, for most of you. So I will do an express introduction of the history of Taiwan. I'll switch uh, later into the alternating cycle of political forgetting during the Japanese colonization, then during the uh, what I call the Kuomintang invasion or the taking over of Taiwan by the uh, National uh, Chinese Army. And uh, I will go into more details into two specific events, the great omission uh, and the specific material absence related to the 22A event, and I will explain later, of course, what is exactly this event. I will go into, uh, as well, a newly opened battle in eradi eradicating KMT dictatorship symbols, which is uh, something that happened right now. And I was planning as well to talk about different politics of remembering uh, of for the neutral past, but I decided to <coughs> cut a little bit. It was a little bit too much. So I will talk a little bit about uh, only the Japanese uh, cu cultural heritage, which is nowadays quite commodified and kawaiized, or mi make, make cute. I mean, it's a Japanese uh, term. So for the quick express um, history of Taiwan, so I use the arrow. Uh, that it's an island uh, located between Japan and, and the Philippines. We're more or less 200 kilometers from the coast of China. And it was uh, first inhabited by humans around 35, between 35 and 30,000 BP. And you might know that uh, it was also colonized by an uh, Austronesian speaking population around 6,000 BP and was the point of uh, entrance and diffusion of Austronesian speaking population in, in the entire Pacific Ocean, as well uh, in Indian Oceans, reaching Madagascar. Uh, the last one colonized was uh, New Zealand, as you might know, uh, only 800 years ago. Taiwan was also colonized uh, later by Europeans. First, the Spanish, at the beginning of the 17th century, mostly in the south, and later by the, uh, mostly in the north, sorry, and later by the Dutch uh, in the south of Taiwan, and they took over uh, the entire island a little bit uh, later. The Dutch actually started a process of migration of Han population from, uh, from nowadays China, with two main groups, uh, people talking, speaking Olo from the coast, um, what is now called Fu Fujian area, and Hakka uh, popula speaking population that is now uh, inland, more inland. As you can see here uh, the two waves of uh, migration related to Dutch needs of workers actually in Taiwan. Uh, at the end of the 17th century, it was taken over by the, the Qing dynasty. And you can see here a map uh, that included Taiwan and uh, which is now in Mongolia. But Taiwan was actually only dominated by Han population on the coast. The rest of the island still being populated only by Aboriginals. In uh, 1895, the island was taken over by Japanese. I won't go into details of the history, but uh, it was uh, Japanese for 50 years until the end of the war. In, uh, and it was, well, so-called retroceased uh, to China, but one specific China, not uh, the communist China, but the anti-communist China, which is the ROC, the R Republic of China, uh, with the Kuomintang. Uh, this, this is the entry of the Kuomintang troops in Taiwan uh, with the arrival of uh, more or less, if I remember well, three million people almost uh, from the continental China, which represent 25% of the population of uh, Taiwan at the time. So a massive uh, wave of new migration. So today Taiwan, as a result of this express history, so Taiwan carries the prints of its previous inhabitants from all the periods <laughs> since prehistory. The archaeological and architectural traces, and especially the temporally distant ones, are elusive and require a strong desire of some component of the society to identify them and to recover or preserve them. Yet, preserving or destroying heritage is never an insignificant, neutral or apolitical choice and uh, we will see that this is particularly true for Taiwan. And you can see here on the screen uh, the site designated by the Ministry of Culture of Taiwan to enter UNESCO World Heritage List. But you have to know that uh, Taiwan is not recognized as a country by anyone apart from six countries in the world. 
And of course, China is putting a veto, veto on this kind of process. So Taiwan cannot actually do this, it's just for the show. Um, they cannot uh, have a list of UNESCO world uh, uh, sites, world heritage sites. But they still propose 18 sites. And interestingly enough, there is one archaeological site, uh, Bainan Archaeological Site, you can, uh, that I, I, uh, I um, selected here. For the rest, it's mostly uh, landscapes, Japanese heritage, colonial heritage from the Dutch and the uh, Spanish, Santo Domingo over there, here. And sites uh, that are related to the conflict between uh, anti-communist China and communist China, like uh, here on the islands facing the continent right now. And interestingly enough, there is absolutely no Chang Qing Dynasty uh, heritage at all, which is a lot. I mean, of the heritage of Taiwan nowadays is con constituted by Qing Dynasty uh, walls, uh, houses, uh, streets, and especially temples. So this is clearly, uh, it's a recent initiative, and this is clearly a political and cultural attempt to differentiate Taiwan from China. So that is a, a strong political choice. Now, we're going to go back into in time and see a little bit uh, the process of Japanese colonization and how they dealt with the uh, visual Chinese looking of Taiwan at the time. So the prerequisite to the formation of a Japanese urban space in Taiwan was for the occupant to eradicate or at least reduce the visual traces of the previous power, which is to say uh, the Manchu dynasty of Qing China, and especially its torturous or narrow alleys. So this is a typical street of Qing dynasty city, and that's a plan of Tainan in the south of, ta of Taiwan, with the walls, the Qing walls, and the st streets of the city, which are quite uh, not really on the grid, apart from the main, the main central ones. And here you see the Japanese uh, Tainan, a bit uh, later, with a more modern grid uh, for the city. Of course, the walls have been removed. So this operation was quickly conducted between 1895 and uh, 900, uh, notably by um, 19, 1900, sorry, notably by destroying administrative and religious centers and some strong landscape mar markers like the wall of the city of Taipei. So those are walls, of course, not from Taipei, but this is the plan of Taipei here. And you can see this is exactly at the beginning of Japanese occupation with the walls here. And that's the new grid uh, 40 years later with a modern city. Uh, and actually, only four gates from the Qing Dynasty were preserved, but moved. So in Japanese Taiwan, only few public buildings or park were in fact following strict Japanese style, such as Shinto shrines. That's what is left of one here in New Taipei. But many private residences around the island followed the Japanese architectural wooden tradition, and many of them are still standing outside of Taipei nowadays. So here are some examples. The traces of the Japanese occupation are everywhere visible, mostly in Taipei, built as a model of the colonial and capitalist Japan of the beginning of the 20th century, with large avenues, a grid, and a clear Western-style architecture co called Grand Style. So when you're not familiar, uh, with the history of Taiwan, you think you're actually looking at British buildings or something like Northern European. But uh, those buildings were built by Japanese architects. In parallel and on the less architectural but more uh, anthropological and archaeological front, the newly founded Japanese university in Taiwan were also deeply embedded in the colonial project. In Taiwan, Japanese anthropology supported the specific origin of the first inhabitants of the island, <coughs> aiming the integration of the island into the Pacific narrative, facilitating the detachment of Taiwan from China. Now, uh, let's switch to the next process uh, with the Kuomintang arrival on the island uh, in 1945. And uh, well, since 1949, actually, after the takeover that is really established, um, a cultural and linguistic Chinese origin of Taiwan was superimposed on uh, the inhabitants through education and on the territory through the display of Chinese architecture and Chinese material heritage transferred from China as a unique and monolithic identity. And I put an example of a very interesting comic uh, made by a Taiwanese um, author 
And uh, the title uh, in Chinese on top says, little by little, I was educated to become Chinese. And she's describing a little bit the process of education, uh, notably saying, uh, uh, you have been, uh, uh, you have been um, indoctrinated by Japanese, and all the dialects you speak in Olo and Aka are uncivilized, inferior, and uh, they shouldn't be used uh, in Taiwan, etc., etc. So that's quite a. Uh, she's actually describing the process of education in the 1980s. So it's pretty uh, recent. The most obvious example of uh, superimposition of a Chinese cultural identity is probably the National Palace Museum, which displays one third of the collection of the Beijing Forbidden Palace. As a result, and since the 1950s, a struggle for political and cultural hegemony could be observed between two antagonistic visions of Taiwan identity. Taiwan as culturally Chinese, and Taiwan as a place of multiple identities. Now for the KMT, the Japanese heritage uh, needed to be taken down. The most alien and mostly non-reusable elements of Japanese culture to be raised first were uh, the Shinto shrines, and that's an example of uh, Taiyoku Grand Shinto Shrine in Taipei. That was uh, quickly transformed into a hotel on a Chinese style, and later uh, a more ostentatious <laughs> hotel on a very Chinese style, uh, standing on top of actually was the Shinto shrine. The housings, particularly characteristic of Japan, were then targeted. But because of the increasing need of housing for the migrant from continental China, many of them were reoccupied by military officers of the KMT. Yet the knowledge of Japanese wood architecture and the particularities of its maintenance being unknown, not to mention uh, a probable low willingness to stay in Japanese wall forever, had for consequence that most of the houses were progressively left to decay or modified extensively until the buildings were covered completely with concrete and corrugated, corrugated iron. The gardens were destroyed and the surfaces of the property reduced. In this case, no systematic destruction strategy was applied, but simply a progressive and unplanned def defacing until reaching the point of fading or vanishing Japanese identity. So you can see here many examples, which actually are quite uh, recent, of some completely uh, almost gone, just like the shape is maintained by the trees, a lot of falling apart ruins of Japanese houses, some still occupied, this is typical of Taipei, but they have been so extensively modified that it are difficult to identify as Japanese. The wooden walls have been covered, uh, f walls have been built extremely close to the house itself and a lot of modification of the architecture has been done uh, and most of the Japanese houses in Taipei are uh, in Taiwan sorry look like this so with a lot of uh, addition of iron and other elements that change the, the visual on it that makes it difficult to identify as Japanese so yet, we could uh, sensitize the symbolic competition engaged against Japanese architectural heritage with three KMT government strategy. Replacement uh, of Japanese strong visual markers, competing building built in front of the Japanese ones or around, defacing or uh, reappropriation of the buildings, and that's an interesting case here of a Shinto shrine, which actually has been mostly preserved, but modified to adopt the uh, the, the standards of Chinese uh, architecture. So the top, the roof is actually a typical Chinese roof, a continental roof on top of a, the structure of a Shinto shrine. And uh, there is a, a tori, a tori that you can say, he, as you can see here, so a gate uh, right here that is from the Japanese period. And on top of the of the temple, they add this symbol, which is actu actually the symbol of the Kuomintang. So it's a political symbol on top of a religious uh, temple. And it seems that nowadays it's dedicated actually to uh, KMT soldiers. Or it's related to military um, people from the Kuomintang. So it's been reused in a certain way, and it's a pretty rare, pretty rare case in, um, in, Taipa in Taiwan. That's another case. An entire district of Japanese houses have been uh, taken down. Uh, this is what th the few that remains nowadays. They look like not much, and uh, that's what was built. Uh, on top of it, so like a huge uh, Chinese type of um, place with uh, opera and theater, and most importantly, the uh, Shanghai Shi Memorial on the, on the bottom. So that's one of the landscape of Taipei that is quite uh, impressive. 
Ironically, in the process, most Japanese grand style survived because of the visual Western identity it, uh, it was connected to. So as a result, today, many Taiwanese do not necessarily associate these buildings with Japanese architects, but with, with an idealized West. So not everyone knows the origin of those buildings. Now, from the Chinese nationalist government perspective, not only Japanese heritage was problematic, but the Austronesian past was also seen as embarrassing, except when this past could be embedded within the theories of northern origin of the Aboriginal people. These theories served the Chinese nationalist idea of a unified history and then supported the necessary and logical reunification of Taiwan with China. In parallel, Aboriginal populations around the island were strongly encouraged in abandoning languages for Mandarin, which they mostly did in exchange of promises of a brighter future, which they did not get. Uh, anyway, they got convinced. So that's the result of elections through the years from 2008 to 2016. The blue, dark blue area vote came tea, Qu Kuomintang, sorry. And those areas are mostly populated by Aboriginals. Even though there is a decrease uh, in the voting uh, for the, the, the Kuomintang for the years, still, the most area, the, those areas are mostly still voting KMT. So the, the process of, of uh, um, uh, modifying uh, you know, the, the memories, in especially in the Aboriginal uh, zone, were quite efficient by the KMT and the education system. That's the omission, the great omission I wanted to talk about. Uh, and we come back in time in 1947. So after the surrender of Japan in 1945, the transition was entrusted to the chief of the anti-communist Chinese army, Chiang Kai-shek. Taiwanese aspiration to independence and autonomy were taken away. And according to the historian Li, a strong resentment was, um, resentment, sorry, was expressed among the insular population, who could only notice that all the powers were divided within a soon dominantly nepo nepotistic minority of continental Chinese. This sudden and profound transformation led to the ma major incident also referred as the 228 incident, so actually in February 28, 1947, that ended up in a massacre uh, in Taipei of uh, the Taiwanese population by the Kuomintang. As the consequence of the 228 incident, the white terror orchestrated by the Kuomintang began, began in 1947 and ended in 1992. During that period, up to 140,000 people were arrested and 18,000 to 28,000 people were executed. As such, most of the Taiwanese elite, engineers, doctors, uh, its intelligentsia, that you have some picture here of the people that were killed, politicians, journalists, academics, and artists, trained in Japanese universities and were ready to take over the democratic and independent state, were systematically uh, exterminated. This trauma actually could not be uh, forgotten by the Taiwanese and could only be forgiven as soon as the materialization, uh, a materialization could be achieved. Responsibility taken and a transgenerational justice could be pronounced even though most protagonists uh, are not alive today. And that's what you can see recently. That was in 2011, a uh, strong protest in the street of Taipei uh, asking for the KMT to admit responsibility for the incident of the 228. There is now a museum open from 2011 where you can see, I took those pictures inside the museum, when you can see this statement, accept responsibility boldly. And here, uh, a proposal by the Association for the Recovery of Historical Memory, actually showing pictures of uh, Spain, where the bodies were actually uh, be excavated uh, to start the process of um, basically uh, justice, or obtaining justice. As such, this process of materialization of memories is slowly being implemented, notably through this museum, creating conflict memories with a generally accepted national narrative carefully built and inculca inculcated by the KMT during 50 years. Now, what is going on, and that's, uh, that's happening, that actually happened two weeks ago, uh, is that Taiwan vote to erase the symbols of his authoritarian history. So now, Chiang Kai-shek, you can see here, being egged. So you can see activists full, uh, throwing eggs to him inside the memorial, which is something that happened quite uh, often. 
Now, everything, all the symbols of the celebration of the glory of Chakai Shea are now forbidden. They will be removed from, the statue will be removed from the schools, from the street name, etc., etc., etc. And what was asked, which means an exhaustive investigation on white terror, will be started. People will be asked to share any piece of art archives, and archaeology is invited to participate into that as well. And that's an example of how Chiang Kai-shek was treated around Taiwan. And uh, you can see here Sun Yat-sen, which is actually the founder of the ROC, the Republic of China, and it's written on his back, ROC out. I was planning as well to talk about um, politics of remembering, but I will just go to the very end and talk about just the Japanese case very quickly. And that's an example of what now is the fashion in Taiwan to reuse all the industrial Japanese buildings for what they call cultural and creative parks in what they call as well the adapt adaptative reuse. And you can see that all in all main cities of Taiwan. So the Japanese original environment uh, in this case is made surely unreadable and mostly practical, cute, kawaii in Japanese, and commercial. As it happens, it has been turned into a space to be consumed, not a space that can be used to learn and reflect on a colonization period. As such, the buildings are not only losing their historical context and being over-commercialized, but, uh, but the park failed to involve public participation, replaced by consumption, and failed to develop any kind of sense of community. Another example, in Jofun, a Japanese colonial landscape has been almost entirely rebuilt or maintained, and this feeling has been reinforced by the extremely popular animation Spirit Away that you might know from the director Ayao Miyazaki, who it's believed had used the location, Jofun, to construct the visuals of his worldwide acclaimed animation. In this case, despite the dark context of the gold mine the development in the area, war prisoners, camps, exploitation, disease, early death, prostitution, etc., etc., the area has been heavily Disneyfied for recreational purposes with very little space for critical reflection on the historical context of the colonization and of the capitalistic exploitation of resources and of people. And I will conclude on this. Despite the cycles of political agendas uh, of forgetting or remembering certain pasts during the previous century, Taiwanese, with many different ethnic backgrounds, are now in the process of appropriation of most pasts in an attempt uh, of building a post-traumatic cultural identity. Many Taiwanese people regard Japanese heritage as intimate uh, sites of memory that offer a new sense of place. The Japanese colonial sites have, been, have become an essential ingredient of a new Taiwanese identity and cultural narrative during the burgeoning memory boom, especially of the 1990s. Yet, these colonial sites pass through a process of appropriation in three stages, described as one, subjected to an open dialogue of multiple memories, two, transformed into sites of locality and commemoration, and three, reinterpreted no longer as legacy of a predatory colonizer, but as new symbol of localism and grassroots pacifist activism. And I regret I removed a picture of a typical building, a Japanese uh, house that has been rebuilt and restored, uh, which I put in the end, which I, re I removed, which is actually now used for storytelling and poetry. Thank you very much.